How many of you grew up in families? How many of you grew up? That's a, we start there. Hopefully none of you. How many of you grew up in families where your dad had a nine to five job? How many of your moms had nine to five jobs? How many of you had nine to five jobs? I love that you're like, I'm not, what? Okay, so I grew up in Philadelphia in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. Uh, I was born in 54, so I grew up um, in the, really grew up in the 60s, 60s and 70s in Philadelphia. And my dad was a cop. That's what he wanted to be when he got out of the Navy. He wanted to be a cop. So he became a, a policeman, cop, and um, my mother married him, and then he had two boys right away, pretty quickly, and he was a police officer, a cop. But that wasn't enough money to raise two boys and my mother um, at that time, so he had to have another job. So he became, what do you think he became? No, bartender, who said that? Yeah, he became a bartender. So now he's a cop during the week and a bartender on the weekends um, because he needed that. Um, and then after a while, working these nine to five jobs to make ends meet, to send us to a, you know, a, a Catholic school education, which cost a lot of money back then for them, um, he finally kind of cashed all that in and decided, you know what, I'm going to get out of the police force uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy a delicatessen and um, be it my own worker, which was now, instead of nine to five, it was eight to midnight <laughs> to run his own delicatessen in Philadelphia, which eventually crashed and burned, and he had to declare bankruptcy and get out of there and then go take another nine to five job selling roofing, which he knew nothing about, but he went and sold roofing. Do, can any of you like think about your own parents, what it was like growing up and watching them jump from job to job, trying to just make ends meet and make, make a living for the family? And this was my entire family, not just my father, but his brothers, my uncles, my mother's sisters and their husbands. They all had the same thing. Jobs that made ends meet, that supported the families that were growing up. And we were all considered, I guess, middle class maybe lower middle class. So this just went on and on and on until he finally retired, um, got at a certain age, where he then lived off of Social Security. And basically, because he didn't have a retirement, he'd already used that to buy the delicatessen and lost it. So now he's living on Social Security. And now I, as the second son, and my brother Tommy, my older brother Tommy, same thing. As soon as he got out of high school, became a cop. And then he became a cop only long enough till he decided, no, I think I'd rather go be a bartender. It was like the same thing happened again. And now he sells cars in Philadelphia. He does very well, but he constantly went from job to job to job. And you may ask, you know, why am I bringing this up? Well, because somewhere along the line, we are taught that that's how life works. Right? We're taught this is the way it goes. Now, not everybody believes this. Not everybody knows this because there are people that don't do that. For instance, me. So when I left home, when I left college, I left college right when my mother died. She died on September 4th, 1974, as I was entering my junior year of college. And as soon as she died, I said, okay, I'm here because of her. She wanted to have one of her children graduate college. And I said, I'm done. I moved to New York to be a Broadway actor. No nine to five job. Even when I got to New York, I never looked for a nine to five job because how could I? So I broke the mold for my family, but they thought I was crazy, absolutely crazy. But the good news is, it's not even about my Broadway career or all the money I made and the success I had. There was a time when I was making more money than all of my family, my father, my brothers, all put together by being in a show, by, by acting. But that's not what did it. Even that wasn't what did it. Even the proof that you don't have to live that way. I just thought I was odd. I still think I'm odd. <laughs> but I just thought, okay, I'm just doing things differently. 
until of course I went to hear Eric Butterworth talk and then go hear Dr. Walker talk and then finally hear the words of Ernest Holmes and understand that we have it backwards. We absolutely have it backwards, that we think we have to work so hard. And I love some of those lyrics, the man, the man's out to get me. The business is out to get me. Life is out to get me. So we have made work a four-letter word, which it is. <laughs> but we've made work this thing, like we have to work. We've made it a, a, a difficult thing, a, a thing that we, are succumb, that we have to succumb to, that we have to go do work. We have to go to work. My son said this week to me, he said, you know, I am loving the fact that I wake up in the morning and I love going to work because he has this job now that he absolutely loves. And I said, well, do you think that's your career? He goes, oh, no, 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 that's just work. That's work. My career is my, my creativity and all. But he's a different generation. He grew up in science of mind. He was like, Dad, I don't think of work as anything bad, but I made sure that the work I'm going to do while I'm growing my career is something I love doing. So that's a whole different scenario than my upbringing where they took jobs they hated just to pay the bills, and then by the weekend, they could have fun. Or maybe in the summer, they'd get that one week off to have fun. So the second chapter in the science of mind is the way it works. And Ernest Holmes said this, the realization that God is universal and that as much good as any individual is able to incorporate into their life is theirs to use is what constitutes the science of mind and spirit. So somewhere along the line, I heard that quote very early on in my study of the science of mind. I somewhere heard, it's not about working. It's about being. It's about remembering who you are. And once you know who you are, what comes out of you, what comes through you is authentic. So he said, man's intelligence is the universal mind functioning at the level of man's concept of it. This is the essence of this whole teaching. So your mind, and we talked about it earlier, your mind is the more. Your mind is quantum mind. It's not just Dean mind. Dean's just using the quantum field to individuate what he wants in life. But we didn't learn that. I don't know that any of us learned that as children. Maybe some of you did if you were in one of the Science of Mind teachings or one of the New Thought teachings. But I didn't learn that. I learned that there was something out here that was going to decide whether I was going to succeed or not, but that I should stay on its good side, <laughs> on his good side. It was a his, right? So my dad and the dad before him believed in this Newtonian way of life. And the Newtonian way of life means whatever is happening in the real world, the world of substance, is all there is. That's all there is. But you and I, we are learning to live from a quantum perspective. We are learning to understand that life is lived from the more, from the more, as the more, and bringing it into our lives. It's not about, and it's not about gluttony or about egotistical uh, or about being selfish. It's not. I want the entire universe, all people everywhere, to know that they are the more. So there's no reason to worry about, does someone get more than I get? Because we are all operating from the same, same design. So we believed back then, and certainly my father believed back then, that there was a God somewhere who would decide whether Arya would get to have what she wants in life. And we even believed, and I, God, I still remember my beautiful Aunt Agnes, who once said to me, uh, something happened terrible in the family, and she just said to me, she said, God sends these things to us because that's the only way we can learn. So it's okay, no matter what happens. Now, there's an interesting sensibility to that, to help you get through life, but still, you're being taught God will send you things because of the inadequacy of yourself to help you learn more. That's not how it works. But we believe that that's how it worked for so long, and we lived our lives from that perspective. 
My Aunt Agnes, she was one of the best metaphysicians. She would go kneel in front of that Blessed Mother altar, and she would, she would get in front of that Blessed Mother altar with those rosary beads hanging down, and she would just pray for exactly what she wanted. Anytime I was in New York having an audition, I would call Agnes. I'd say, Agnes, get over to the cathedral. I'm auditioning for, uh, for a big Broadway show. I really need this one. She goes, I'm on it. <laughs> and she would go. I, because, that was like the way we use practitioners because she would go and say, Mary, you got to help him. <laughs> and I, I felt good about that. I really did. So this God in the sky thing that my father and my father's father and his father before him and all of my brothers even to this day, because they're all still very Christian in tone, they still believe that there's something out there that's designing your life. Even the other day, my brother said to me, you know, Jim, I just think maybe it's God just doesn't see me having that kind of life. And I was like... But I, and I was able to say, I said, well, basically, you're not seeing you have that kind of life. He said, well, how can I see it if he doesn't see it? <laughs> it's like, oh, God. Um, but we did have a great discussion, and, and he is getting better at understanding that, no, no one, no one doesn't want you to succeed. It's, it, that's really kind of a, 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 just a, a, a way of making sense out of what's going on, as opposed to making, using sense to make what you want going on. So Ernest Holmes said, we shall find a better God when we shall have arrived at a higher, higher standard for mankind. So I want to ask you today to ask yourself, how high is your standard? How high is the standard you live your life by? I would say, <laughs> I'm just like, I'll walk around, I'll tell you how high your standards are. <laughs> no, I would say... All you got to do is look at your life and decide how high your standard is and say, well, apparently the standard of my life is a beautiful home in Studio City with an, probably the most amazing husband on the planet, beautiful children, a great spiritual center, and there's more. And there's got to be more. There's got to be more than even all of that as great as all that is, and I have gratitude for it all, but what's the standard I want to live by? I want this teaching to get bigger. I want this teaching to really go global. I want this center. I want every seat in this center to be filled and make us have to do two services, which we won't. <laughs> they can go home and watch it on TV. <laughs> but that's what I want. Thor, I know, wants the same thing. We've talked about it. So how high is the standard of this center if there's still 100 seats empty. No, I'm not judging that. And you know, it's like preaching to the choir. You're all here. But we have to really be clear how high a standard of living, as it says, we shall find a better God when we shall have arrived at a higher standard for mankind. So it's just a question for you. How high is the standard of life that you want to live by? And are you living it? I guess the real question is, what are you equal to? Because if you want to know what you're equal to, you're already living what you're equal to. You are living right now what you have been equal to so far. So far. But you don't have to keep living so far. You can keep growing, expanding. Um, I always talk about the AEPs, your already established premises. And um, one of the AEPs that I grew up with in my family, you ready? You've heard me say this before. Their whole motto, which some of them are, this is still their motto, we don't get the breaks. Oi, exactly. <laughs> we don't get the breaks. And the funny thing is, when I moved to New York, I was, like, I was like, really? Watch. And I got the breaks because I still believed there were breaks to get. And I got them. Almost everything I auditioned for, I got. Everything I wanted, I got until I didn't. And it was this one show. It was right after I'd already starred on Broadway. This was going to put me above the title, starring with a huge star. It was all set. The contracts were being negotiated. I'd gotten through like all the auditions to get the part. And I was on my way home 
to Philadelphia where they were throwing me this big, big party to celebrate this part. And in Trenton, New Jersey, when I got off the train to get on the local to Philly, I called home. I, I called my agent. I said, so how much? What's the salary? Silence. He was like, he's changed his mind. They, picked, they chose someone else. And I'm on my way to a party. I was like, are they allowed to do that? <laughs> He was like, yeah, the contract wasn't signed yet, and uh, yeah, he gave it to someone else. Now, don't feel bad for me. I do enough of that myself. Um, <laughs> yeah, you do get used to it, yeah. But that I wasn't getting used to. But when I got to Philadelphia, and I walked in, and there were balloons, and everybody screaming, and I, then I had to say, I didn't get the part. What did I hear my Aunt Carolyn say instantly? Oh my God, we never get the breaks. <laughs> that somehow seeped in, because then I started missing. I started not getting this part, not getting that part. And it took me, and I hadn't heard Eric Butterworth speak yet. I hadn't, hadn't gotten there yet. So I started thinking that maybe, maybe, maybe it isn't for me. Maybe I'm not going to be the big Broadway star I thought I was going to be, even though I'd just done it and I'd just proved it. Um, and so that crept in there until I got this teaching, until I really understood this teaching. Ernest Holmes says, our belief sets the limit to our demonstration of a principle which of itself is without limit. That's one of my favorite quotes in the entire book. Isn't that a great quote? Your belief sets the limit to a demonstration of a principle which in itself is beyond limit, is without limit. So if you're going to believe we never get the breaks, holy crap, good luck with life. So you're sitting here this morning hearing this. What's yours? What rolls around your mind that's setting the limit for what you can accomplish? Because the chapter title is the way it works, and this is how it works, folks your mind. What do you believe? What is it that you believe? What are you? And he says this. I love this. It is not a question of God's willingness. It is entirely a question of our own receptivity. Now, some of you have been sitting here, Pauline, how many years have you been sitting here? 42, 42 years. Pauline has been sitting here. The question is, she's heard it all, haven't you? You've, how, many, how many people have been listening to this stuff for years? Raise your hand. Great. Okay. So you've heard it all. I don't say anything new. I just say it kind of interestingly. And, <laughs> you know, and I use my own self as a, as a guideline. But with all of that, how much of it are you willing to embody? Not just hear, not just get, not just understand, but how much of it are you willing to receive? Really receive. Absolutely receive. Refuse not to receive, to really get it. Because that's what it is. It's not a question. There's no God out there saying, yep, Jill, I'm going to give you this, uh, but not this. This is, it. this is for Laura, but this is yours. No, that, that's not the way it works. The way it, <laughs> the way it works is you're designing it. It's your own receptivity. And I love when he said this. He said, we are thinking, willing, knowing, conscious centers of life. You are thinking. What's that thing I use a lot in class? I am thinking. What am I thinking? Do I want to live the results of what I'm thinking? There's the one, two, three. Because you are thinking. What you're thinking, that's up to you. But to say to yourself, do I want to live the results of that? Do, am I ready to up the standard of what I want to live life? So the question is, as much as we can believe will be done unto us. So we're going right back to Jesus. It is done unto you as you believe. And as much as you're willing to believe, but, but I want you to point this out. As much as you can believe will be done unto you. You may believe that you don't get the breaks. And that's what will be done unto you. You might, you might believe I'm good for a hundred thousand dollar a year job, but but the quarter of a million dollar job or the or the million dollar job or I heard a friend of mine said said, Could you imagine being a billionaire? I didn't even take a breath. I went, Yes. <laughs> I could imagine being a billionaire. I could be I could imagine being the richest person in the universe. And then I would give so much of it away. But not just to people who needed it. 
I'd give it away to places where it could grow people. I'd like to teach people to fish, not feed them. So, as much as we can believe will be done unto us. So, this is, this is, I know we say this all the time, but what have you been believing so far in your life? Where are you in this game of belief? What have you been believing so far? I have people who are, have such a hard time with the technology today. They can't, they can't, you know, putting a PowerPoint to music and all this stuff. I know, I know who you are. Um, <laughs> and you know what? That's a belief you have. You believe it's hard, and it is hard. You believe every time you try it, it's going to explode in your face. And so it does. And then I explode in your face. <laughs> because it's annoying. <laughs> right? It's all about belief. You just have to decide. You know what? I live in 2024. So I want to learn everything there is to learn about 2024. What is TikTok? What is Instagram? What is, <laughs> I know, this is like last year. What is all this stuff? Let's start using it. Let's start being it. Let's start being, not being afraid or intimidated by it, but let's get with the program, folks. So it's funny. Um, a friend of ours came over to the house the other day uh, for business and had brought a video with him of something I didn't know was even out in the world. Uh, when I was 20, well, when I moved to New York in 1975, in 1976, I did my first Broadway show. And I don't think about that show much. I've never even mentioned it, that I did this Broadway show, shockingly so. <laughs> but I'm doing today. I'm covering it. Um, it was a musical called Very Good Eddie from the 1920s. It was revived in 1974, 75. And so this guy opened his computer and pressed a button, and I was like, there's me in the chorus, which I said I never was in. Wow. And so I'm watching myself on the Jerry Lewis telethon dance as a 20, I think I was 23 years old, this intricate choreography. And I'm watching the whole thing, and, and he's having a great time, and Kevin had never seen it either, and we're watching it, and, but, but something in my stomach, I was like, what is going on here? I'm watching, but I'm watching my face. I mean, I already knew I danced it. I'm watching my face, and sometimes the camera comes close to me, and I'm watching my face, and I'm like, do I still have that wonder? Do I still have that excitement? Do I still have that passion? And it's a five-minute clip, and it just kept going and going. And then came my solo dance part, and I was like, my God, what, do I still have that kind of freedom to just let it go? And so, luckily... The answer was, yes, I do. I really do. But there was that boy on the screen just really, really encapsulated what I'm talking about today. That I know who I am. I know what I can do. I walk into New York, and I get a Broadway show. It's not as easy as it sounds, but I thought it was because I was just going to do it. And that was prior to we don't get the breaks. And I looked at that face. So I showed it to my son and besides the fact that he just thought it was the funniest thing he ever saw. <laughs> and he said, he said, hard to, he said, he said, you look a little gay. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, it was the style of the day. It was the 1920s, and they were all kind of dandy-esque. And so he said, no, he said, Dad, it's hard to think that two years later someone thought he should play riff. <laughs> <clears throat> Everyone's a critic. So Ernest Holmes says this, the approach to life should be direct and it should be specific. So I told you that there were songs I was thinking of doing. I had decided to bring in the music video of She Works Hard for the Money from Flashdance and having you, and not even having them have to sing anything, but watching the Flashdance video. You know, she works hard for the, right? And then I watched it. Thank God I didn't just clip it and send it to Thor. But then I watched it, and it was so sexual, I knew Steve Brabant was going to give me hell if I did that. <laughs> um, it was like really a little bit too much. And then also the lyrics didn't really work for me, which is when I got nine to five. So what if we all got it wrong? What if all of us even have gotten it wrong so far? And we really think we have to work hard for the money. We really think we have to work nine to five. We really think we have to go out there and make something happen in our lives. 
And really, the truth is, the quantum field works perfectly. You know that, right? The quantum field does what it does perfectly every single second of every single day. The particles and the space all around it are all creating this beautiful, interwoven, non-direct locality called life. And it's flowing through Doug Draper right now. He doesn't have to do anything. It's, already do it's doing exactly what it needs to do right now. What if our only purpose in life really was to be it? Not to, not to even have to make something out of it, but to be it. And once we be it, then it's kind of like Jesus said, right? We just speak our word, and so it is. That's what and so it is is all about, by the way. And so it is. It doesn't say, and so maybe eventually when I get it, it's going to be. And if someone says that at the end of your treatment, call me. <laughs> yeah. And so it is. Because it is. It is. It already is. So I was at Joy Cafe. How many people like Joy Cafe? I know that T Tiffany absolutely loves it. Okay, so I was at Joy, Joy Cafe a year ago. It was just a year ago. And I was leaving, and in the, there was a sandwich board, and there was a thing, and then at the end it said, love the universe, and here's what it said. The only way to get what you really want is to know what you really want. Number one. The only way to know what you really want is to know yourself. Three, the only way to know yourself is to be yourself. And the only way to be yourself is to listen to your heart. Love the universe. The universe is doing all the work. So why are you overexerting yourself? Because the only thing we have to learn how to do is to be ourselves, is to be the more, is to tap in, drop into that more. And then as it's filtering through us, your mind, your brain, your thoughts, you will create the most amazing, the most amazing, fantastic life that you could ever imagine. The universe works for us by working through us. So let it. Let it work in your life for you by letting it work through you. Drop in, drop out, and allow this thing itself to do what it does, understanding, knowing who you are, that you are this, I know who I am, I know what I want, and now I am going to let it unfold me. Namaste. Thank you.